Hello, this is a uh, special video presentation of, uh, of a field day for hams with technician licenses. Let's uh, get things uh, started here. Uh, yeah, this is, this is not going to be your, uh, your typical field day uh, because uh, we can't set up the big tents. We can't bring everybody together. Uh, so we're going to have to, uh, uh, it means that there's not going to be uh, control operators with general or extra licenses available so that technicians are able to operate HF radios for doing uh, uh, contacts. Uh, but, you know, what is field day really all about? Well, what ARRL says uh, is a premium is placed on developing skills to meet the challenges of emergency preparedness. Well, Emergency preparedness doesn't just happen when everybody has a chance to go pull their tents together and, and work together. Sometimes you have to do it individually. So this year, that's what's going to happen is we're going to be focusing more on individual skills and less on sort of the group skills that are normally in field day. Now, there's a bunch of different types of classes and all of this is covered in the field day rules that's available from ARRL. Uh, the easiest one to do is a class D station. This is basically you use the same radios, antennas, the whole business uh, at your home, just run offline power. Uh, the only downside of that is that you can't count contacts with other class D stations. So you have to talk to, uh, you know, classes A through A through F, with the exception of D. Now you can. Uh, change your class D home station into a class E home station by doing emergency power. And in the case of technicians, where often the radios are fairly low power, you're not running 1500 watts, uh, running off batteries becomes much more of a possibility or a generator or a solar, solar charger. Another thing that also can be appealing for technicians is to actually go mobile because that allows you to travel around to different places in order to get contacts. Now, during the uh, Virginia QSO party, one of the popular things for some people to do is to go up in the mountains and drive back and forth, uh, you know, or, or east and west across the state and, uh, and call CQ as they're, they're going across in order to try to contact as many stations as possible. And that uh, basically you're using your car power and, uh, and uh, it lets you uh, do DXing by basically uh, uh, your body does part of the DXing and the radio does the other part. And then finally, there's what's called class B, which is a portable station. For this one, you aren't using the, the re your regular antennas. You're using a, a antenna put up especially for a field day within a certain period of time before field day. Uh, and if, if you are running with five watts or less, that can make you a special uh, class B battery station. And there's some extra things you can get points for by, uh, by doing that. Now, what equipment do you need to participate? Well, even a modest radio can do it. I mean, you can you can make contacts with an with an HT. Now the odds are you're not going to be making contacts, you know, all over the United States. Uh, you're probably probably Texas and California are not on your list of places you're going to be talking to, but it still means that you can contact other hands, which would be the sorts of things demonstrating what you're doing, sort of an emergency situation there. Now. Um, if you want to, to make, it, uh, make it better, one of the things you can do is to uh, get a higher power radio. Obviously, if you're talking about using a mobile radio instead of an HT, you might be talking about, you know, 70 watts or so. Well, that's, that's probably going to get out better. Uh, also, better antennas. Now, Beam antennas do not need to be big and expensive. Uh, over on the, the right here, what we have is a, uh, an example of a, uh, an antenna that's basically made out of cut pieces of a tape measure. And this is an online, the, the link's up at the top there. 
that will tell you how to construct a beam antenna. So you can go out and point it at different, different places in order to, uh, to, to talk to, to more hams over the course of field day. Now, you can also work six meters and 10 meters. Now that obviously requires that you have a radio that supports six meters and 10 meters, and not everybody's going to have that. But if you do, those are frequencies you can operate on. If you have a real HF radio, you can also do CW on lots of frequencies. We'll talk about that a little, little bit more in a second. Uh, now, the ARRL actually puts out a special guide for VHF operations. This is on the ARRL website, the Field Day website at the link above. And this is a PDF about how to operate uh, using VHF on Field Day. Now, uh, one thing that's really important is no repeaters, okay? You're not going to be contacting repeaters in order to uh, to do your contacts. Contacts have to be your radio to their radio, the simplex con contacts. And this makes, makes good sense. In an emergency, you can't count on repeater infrastructure or any infrastructure working. You have to do what you can do yourself, and that's what simplex is. And usually there are there's a variety of simplex frequencies are available, but usually the ones that are going to be most popular are going to be 146.520 for VHF and 446.000 for UHF, uh, because those are the, the calling frequencies for, uh, for, for simplex for VHF and, and UHF. Now, one of the things also is there are going to be other technicians out doing things. So don't call CQ all day long without pause. Let somebody else have a chance to get in and do a little, little bit too. Uh, now, you may get really lucky because both VHF and UHF, if you get tropospheric ducting, or if you get what call, what's called sporadic E, that can let you get out hundreds of miles. And, and in rare cases, uh, tropo tropospheric uh, ducting can actually get you all the way to Europe. That's uh, going to, that, that doesn't happen very often, but nonetheless, there's some, some opportunities to be had in the early morning. And that's discussed in this, uh, in this uh, manual as well. Another thing that's also uh, something that you might not have thought about is a satellite. One of the, uh, the options that you have is to have uh, do satellite communications. Now with satellite, you tend to use a fixed transmit frequency, but as the satellite is passing over, what you tend to do is you tend to change your receive frequency. This is because there's a Doppler effect caused by the, the satellites moving really fast that causes the radio frequencies to change a little bit. Now they automatically adapt for it, for your transmitted signal, but you have to adapt to them for the received signal. And I've seen on YouTube examples of where people just have little whip antennas on an HT and they're, they're talking on a satellite. So that's a, a great way to get some of those DX uh, QSOs. Uh, also, uh, a Yagi antenna also can be sort of uh, sort of helpful for that as as well, a uh, directional antenna. Um, I talked about uh, CW a little bit. One of the things that's nice about uh, uh, even with a technician license, if you know Morse code, you can use CW to do field day contacts. And what's nice is they count twice as much. A CW contact is worth two points, whereas a VHF voice contact is only worth one point. So that's a way of sort of racking up, uh, racking up some extra points there. Now, there are plenty of people in the club that will be glad to help you learn how to do CW. Uh, we had an email the other week about some, uh, some programs from Google that helped to do it. There are uh, training programs that you can get on your cell phone that will feed you the code so that you can understand it. Also, you don't have to be 
really fast in order to, to do CW on field day. Basically what you're exchanging are just call signs and very basic information. You're not, you're not transmitting long sentences. It's just a little bit here and there. So this might be that great opportunity to learn, learn CW. Again, you would of course want to use this probably with an HF radio as, as well. Uh, now, what is it, uh, what is a exchange like when you're making contact on field day? Typically, you're going to be doing CQ field day, CQ field day, CQ field day, and then listening to hear who calls you. Or you may be on the frequency and you hear somebody else say CQ field day. Now, the information that you need to exchange when you contact somebody is, first of all, you got to get their call sign. And a lot of times when I hear somebody calling uh, 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 the uh, 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 CQ field day, I will actually listen for their call sign. And usually we'll do CQ field day and then they will give their call sign. Uh, and I will listen to that and I will have that written down even before I try to contact them. So I don't have to, have to worry about getting it right when they're talking to me. Uh, anyway, you're gonna send them your call sign. They're gonna send you their call sign. And then you're going to send them a special code. And that code is going to be how many transmitters you're using and what type station you have. We talked about 1D, a home station. We talked about 1E, a home station with emergency power. We talked about 1C, the, poor, the mobile station, et cetera. Uh, and so what you would say is, typically you just have one transmitter. So you'd say, I, I'm 1E if you're running off battery powered, and then you need to say your state, so in Virginia. So I might say, you know, this is W4DO, and I am one echo in Virginia, Victor Alpha. The Victor Alpha part is just sort of the, to make it in, in phonetic symbols so that they, if I mispronounce Virginia, they'll, they'll be able to pick it up there. Uh, and it's also not uncommon when you're working with UHF and VHF to also exchange grid squares. Uh, these are given as a, as a uh, alphanumeric code, like F, I'm in FM08RA, and uh, there's a, a website that will let you look up what the, what the grid codes are so that you can, you can see where, where people are. But for field day, the critical thing is to know what was the, uh, the number of transmitters, the class, the state, and of course, their call sign. Now, uh, on the ARR web website, there is uh, example sheets that you can pull down and print for doing logging. So in this case here, I was on 146.520 using FM. Uh, I would record the time uh, in, uh, in Greenwich, England there the station that I talked with, and then uh, I, I heard from them that they were 1C in Maryland, and I told them that I was 1D in Virginia. And that's a, uh, th that is all that's required for, for an exchange there. Now, you can also use logging software such as the N3FJP uh, field day software, which cost you $9 if you don't spend the $50 and get the unlimited license. Uh, but you don't have to have the software. Now this form here is actually used for recording things on field day, but it didn't, wouldn't actually be the thing you would submit to ARRL. What you would do is take the data off of this form and then uh, put it into the special form that ARRL would like. And the field day rules and the ARRL website is gonna have all the information you need to know about what the, what the forms are. You may also know somebody that has the N3 FJP software, and maybe they'd be willing to take your log and after they've submitted their entry, clear out their field day information and, uh, and, and submit your information electronically as well. Well, the most important field day rules, learn something new and have fun. That's the, that's the most, uh, most important one. I'll, I'll throw in there, be safe, be healthy, but be sure to have fun as well. Anyway, hope you've enjoyed that, uh, that introduction to field day for technicians, and we look forward to hearing you on the air on, on field day. 
last uh, last full weekend in June every year. Thanks.